Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Please take out your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Today we'll be reading from verses 1 through 5. And before we read the text, let us come before the Lord. And pray that he would prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for your love. And we do ask that you open the blind eye and the deaf ear. That you would come to us, your people, Lord. That, Father, we are fully aware of how helpless we are. We're aware, Lord God, that we wouldn't even know you if it weren't for your word and it wasn't for your spirit illuminating our minds to be able to see and understand. So, Father, we ask this morning that you would continue to open our eyes and our ears and continue to to till the, the soil of our hearts so the seed of your word would fall and take root and that it would grow up and bear fruit in our lives. That you would continue to work through the Holy Spirit and your word to transform us more and more into the image of your Son, that we would walk circumspectly, Lord, that we would, we would be killing sin in a way that is fitting, Lord, that we would also walk in faith and repentance, knowing that those things are gifts that you have given us, and that, Father, that we walk not by sight, but by faith, trusting, Lord God, your Word and all that it contains. And I pray, Lord, as we continue to grow and be people of the Word, Lord, that we would, Lord, bear the image of Christ in our lives. We pray, Father, that you would bless this time together, and most importantly, that you would be glorified and worshipped as we gather. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And the word of the sovereign Lord reads this way. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Pastor and author John Piper once wrote, What did Abraham find? Abraham found grace in the eyes of the Lord through faith alone. It's no secret that this is one of my favorite times of the year living in Boron, where it's either absolutely hot or freezing. This is that little brief time of year where things seem to be really tolerable. I mean, the weather is starting to warm up a little bit. The days are starting to get a little bit longer. In fact, uh, as we talked about, the time is going to change, uh, and we will spring forward, right? The trees are beginning to bloom. We'll start to see the the green pop out, and soon the the, the flowers will come with them. And you know right now, by this little shift in the weather and the shift in the days, that spring is upon us. In fact, spring officially will be here uh, in 14 days. March the 20th marks uh, the actual beginning of spring. And with spring then and the renewal of spring, we were reminded then that Easter is upon us, which ultimately is the celebration of renewal, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we here at First Baptist Church, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ every Sunday. 
because we celebrate the gospel every Sunday. But Easter is a time of year where the whole world finally comes around and at least is paying attention to this truth, whether they want to or not, right? And at this time of year, the religious and the semi-religious begin to really pay attention to Easter. Because as we talked about, Easter this year will be April the 17th, which means last Tuesday in New Orleans was Fat Tuesday, right? And last Wednesday was the beginning of Lent, which is called Ash Wednesday. Now, what is Lent? Well, Lent is a 40-day period of time excluding Sundays leading up to Easter. And it's historically been a, a, a time period where people will take some time and reflect on the resurrection of Christ. And during this time, people would tend to examine their lives and they would fast. Uh, in fact, one... Uh, uh, one author notes that Lent is, is intended to be a time of self-denial and moderation and fasting and forsaking of sinful activities and habits. That's why you'll hear people ask each other, what are you going to give up for Lent? Because you're giving something up. Some people will give up drinking. Other people will give up eating things like candy or, you know, steak, heaven forbid. Some people will give up cussing. Other people will give up, you know, you know, video games or whatever, whatever they feel that's getting in their way of their relationship with God, they will give up in preparation for Easter Sunday. That is why, right? That is why they also, the day prior to Lent is called Fat Tuesday. Because Fat Tuesday, knowing that Lent's coming up, they, what do they do? They party, right? Eating and drinking and doing whatever they want to do, knowing that they're going to have to give things up for 40 days. That's what Fat Tuesday is about. Now, Lent is practiced by Roman Catholics, but it's also practiced by some Protestant denominations, and it certainly can be a time of profitable reflection for those people who decide to participate in it. And it's important to note that the tradition of Lent is not found in the Bible. It is not a biblical mandate, right? But at the same time, there's no prohibition against it either. Some people feel value in fasting and self-denial during this period leading up to Easter. And so really it's up to each individual person in their conscience whether to participate in that or not, because we all in this area and others have liberty as Christians to be able to, to pursue our consciences and how the Holy Spirit guides us. Now what we need to understand though is in the Roman Catholic tradition, the beginning of Lent is what is called Ash Wednesday literally the day of ashes. And this is where a priest will take ashes and make the sign of a cross on someone's forehead. Uh, and it is meant to be an outward sign of repentance. Because as Roman Catholics uh, note, in the Old Testament, repentance and sorrow for sin was oftentimes accompanied with the sprinkling of ashes or dust. You've heard of the expression sackcloth and ashes. And so for our Roman Catholic friends, Ash Wednesday is the beginning of a period of time focused on a visible repentance in their, in their lives. And it's not just my opinion or observation of this, it's actually their own understanding. In fact, a very good friend of mine who is a Roman Catholic posted this picture on Facebook about the subject of Lent, and it, and it reads, The act of applying ashes to our foreheads symbolizes our mortality as well as our need for ongoing repentance. Ashes are applied to our forehead in a sign of the cross as the words, remember that you were dust and to dust you will return, are spoken to us. The other formula which is used, turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel, emphasizes our call to continual conversion and holiness of life. We don't wear ashes to proclaim our holiness, but to acknowledge we are sinners in need of renewal and repentance. So our Catholic friends on Ash Wednesday uh, Lent and Ash Wednesday are about an act of repentance. Now with that, as Christians who have a high view of, of Christ and a high view of the Scriptures and a high view of the Gospel, we see that there is a great importance and there is great value in repentance. In fact, we would say that the Christian life is to be lived in faith and repentance because Jesus Himself said the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the Gospel. More literally, the way the language bears itself out in Mark is actually be repenting and be believing the gospel. It's an ongoing sense of the word. 
So we acknowledge that we continue to live our Christian life through faith and repentance. And as Christians, we ought to feel the weight of our sins when we commit them. We ought to, at times, be sorrowful for our sins. As Paul even says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, For godly gr- grief, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And so sorrow for sin and repentance, those are good things in our understanding of the gospel. Now, I mention this, right, not only because we're closing on Easter, but I mention this for two important reasons. Number one, we need to recognize as Christians that we share some common truths with those in the Roman Catholic Church. There, this, is some, this is something that is often overlooked by many people who identify themselves as evangelicals. But it is the truth. We have a number of truths in common with those in the Roman Catholic tradition. And the reason for that is because contrary to some opinions, right, we all come from the same stream of Christianity. Now, some will say that true Christians, they have a lineage and a history outside of the Catholic Church that existed alongside the Catholic Church and somehow miraculously preserved over time. The problem is, and I've heard that story and read books about that, the problem is that history itself tells a different story. There's just simply no historical support for that hypothesis that somehow, someway, there was this fledgling fledgling Christian group that existed outside of the stream of, of, of... of of the Roman Catholic Church early on. The truth is Christians come through the same stream in the very early church. We all go trace our roots back to the apostles. And this continued all the way through to the Reformation. That's the historical facts. Which means we, we, we all have a common Christian heritage. Both Protestants and Roman Catholics alike will look back to the same church fathers and look to their writings, we will all look back to Augustine. We all look back to Athanasius. We all look back to to Nicholas. In fact, St. Nicholas was a real person. He didn't so much give away toys to kids, he punched heretics in the face. But that's a whole different different story, right? We look back to Turretin. We look back to Thomas Aquinas and so on. Not to mention our foundational doctrinal understandings come through the same creeds, the Apostles' Creed the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, even the the Council of Chalcedon, our understanding of the Trinity comes right out of that council, which means we have then a shared doctrinal understanding, right? Roman Catholics and Protestants alike believe in the triune nature of God. We affirm that God is one in essence and three in persons. We all believe that Christ was born of a virgin, that this is not symbolic, but it's a literal truth. We believe in the literal incarnation, that that God did become a man. We believe in a literal resurrection, that it wasn't just Jesus' spirit resurrected, but His body came back to life. We all believe that God is the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. We believe that the Bible is the word of God. We believe that there is no salvation outside of Christ and more. And so we have a lot in common. We have a common heritage and a common lineage, common truths, and we even have a common vocabulary. We, we mean the same thing when, when we say the cross, right? We mean the same thing when we say um, um, crucifixion. Right? And so this, by the way, is why I can affirm, along with the late R.C. Sproul, that there are many people who were born, again, believers, inside of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, R.C. Sproul was recorded as saying in a conference, he says, I believe that there are millions of people in the Roman Catholic Church who are trusting in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. And I agree with him. That's why I would would say that many of these Roman Catholic, uh, many of them are our brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, I had a conversation this summertime. Um, I was hanging out with some of Kim's friends from work where she worked before, and uh, I met a couple from Ireland who were staunch in their defense of the unborn, and they were Roman Catholic. And we had a wonderful conversation, and they asked me lots of questions about about why I'm Reformed, and I found that they were trusting in the same thing that I'm trusting in for salvation. That is Christ and Christ alone. 
and I would be happy to call them my brethren. And so I agree that with R.C. Sproul when he says that, that, that there are many who are in the Roman Catholic Church who are, are truly born again. But I also agree when, when he says that Rome itself has categorically and consistently and clearly denied the gospel. The Roman Catholic Church through its history, has supplanted the Word of God with tradition, and those traditions have perverted the gospel of grace. Hence the reason for the Reformation itself. And the thing that we need to understand is that Martin Luther and Calvin were not trying to start a new church or a new denomination. They were not trying to take the old and just throw it all out and begin again. They were trying to actually work within the church to bring Reformation to the church because the Roman Catholic Church was the main body of believers in the world. But it had lost its way. And so, it's become corrupt in, and lost sight of the gospel. And, and the powers that be in Rome, when the Reformation started, refused to reform. And so the truth of the gospel was no longer preserved in the Roman Catholic Church. It was... It was preserved in the continuation of the church in the Protestant denomination, which leads to the second reason why I'm talking about this. The second reason why I'm talking about this is though that we share a common history and that we share common truths with the Roman Catholic Church, our understanding of those truths can be vastly different. Which means what we see in this understanding of the repentance related to Ash Wednesday is different than what the Roman Catholics see. Because again, I want you to notice the language that's used here. The act of applying ashes to our forehead symbolizes our mortality as well as our need for ongoing repentance. Notice there's a connection then between mortality and ongoing repentance. The idea is that if you don't repent, then you will die in your sins and be lost. You're reminded that you're going to die. So you better repent before it's too late. And then it says, ashes are applied to to our forehead in a sign of the cross. As the words, remember, you are dust and from to dust you will return are spoken to us. The other formula which is used, turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel, emphasizes our call, listen to this, our call to continual conversion and holiness of life. Again, we would agree that that, 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 that we should be, that we are called to pursue, pursue holiness. I think that if you're a Christian, that, that you should just embrace that truth, that we are called to pursue holiness because God has given us that in our hearts to pursue it. But it says here that there's a continual call to conversion. You see, the meaning of that is that the believer and his conversion is not finished in this life. Meaning that conversion is an ongoing process, meaning that justification then for them is not complete. This is, for the Catholic, for the Roman Catholic, justification is not a judicial pronouncement of God. It's an ongoing process where a person is given bits of grace as he goes on through his life. That's the emphasis of the tradition. You receive a little bit of grace when you go to Mass. You receive a little bit more grace when you take the Eucharist. You get a little bit more grace when you do penance. You get a little bit more grace when you, you know, put ashes on your forehead. You get a little bit more grace when you do this thing and when you do that thing, and they have to do it over and over and over again. For the Roman Catholic, conversion and justification are just not settled issues by faith. In fact, notice the last line that says, we, do not, we don't wear ashes to proclaim our holiness, but to acknowledge that we are sinners who are in need of repentance and renewal. Which, by the way, is not what the gospel teaches. If you are in need of renewal, if you're in need of renewal, that means you have not been renewed. And if you've not been renewed, that means you've not been born again. And if you've not been born again, then you're not a Christian. Because to be a Christian means to be renewed. Paul says you were dead in your sins and your trespasses, but made alive in Christ. Jesus calls us to this renewal, to be born again, he says. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Renewal unto life is, is not an ongoing process. Sanctification is an ongoing process, but renewal and conversion happen instantaneously when we are justified by faith in Christ. And the thing that we need to see here is even though that we have a common heritage and a common history and a common vocabulary with the Roman Catholic Church, what Rome teaches and what we believe about salvation and repentance are not the same thing. This is not a matter of religious preferences for tradition. It's simply a matter of different teaching. What Roman what Rome teaches and what we believe about salvation are not the same thing. For Rome, conversion and salvation is an ongoing act, an act that has to be maintained until death. Otherwise, we can fail, and then our conversion and salvation are lost. And because of this understanding, repentance is an act then of a person that they engage in to continue to perpetuate their conversion. Or in other words, if you don't continue to repent, you will forfeit the grace given to you and lose whatever salvation you have gained. Thus, repentance is a work in obedience to the law. Now, as Christians, we affirm that repentance and faith go together. That they are the, they're two sides of the same coin. And we affirm the call for us to walk in continual repentance and faith. But we believe that repentance is not a condition of our salvation, but rather a gracious gift that God grants to us. You see, there are three kinds of repentance in the world. You have natural repentance, you have legal repentance, and you have what's called evangelical or gospel repentance. Natural repentance in the words of John Calhoun is the natural feeling of sorrow and self-condemnation of which a man is conscious for having done that which he sees he ought not to have done. Right? It's the natural, natural repentance is the guilt that we experience for doing the wrong thing. And, and anyone can experience this emotion. Even people who, don't, who say they don't believe in God, right? because they know the difference between right and wrong, will at times be confronted with doing something wrong. They will be told that they're doing something wrong, and they will acknowledge that they're doing something wrong, and they'll feel guilt for doing that. And they'll even go so far as to apologize, and maybe, not, and maybe make a point to never do that thing again. That's natural repentance. We all have that ability, right? When we have our relationships with other people, we, we have the ability to naturally repent of the, way, the wrongdoing we do. And then there's legal repentance. Legal repentance relates to the religious people and is a feeling of regret produced in legalists by the fear that that violation of the divine law and especially of gross sins expose him to eternal punishment. In this case, it's a sense that a, a person has done wrong, and because they've done wrong, they're at odds with God, and by turning away from that, wrongdoing and repenting of that sin, that person then feels that they have made atonement, in a sense, for that wrongdoing. This right here is the Roman Catholic understanding of repentance. When a person is baptized into the church, they are placed into a state of grace. But then as they live their life, they fall below the line. And over time, they risk losing their salvation, especially their sins continue to be grave enough. And so they must continually repent of those things and do penance in order to re-atone for those transgressions. It's a continual, ongoing life of work to obey the law, hence Ash Wednesday. But then you have the evangelical repentance. Evangelical repentance or gospel re repentance is altogether different from either of these. It's a, it's a gracious principle and habit implanted in the soul of the believer by the Spirit of Christ. Repentance for, for the Christian is a gift from God. God enables the believer to turn from sin, not in an effort to make atonement for sin, but in order to turn toward Him for His mercy. In fact, let me just illustrate the, the, the difference. Legal repentance is this. I have sinned and transgressed the law, and because of that, God is angry with me. And now... Because he's angry with me, I'm in danger of hellfire, right? 
I'm in danger of losing my salvation because of what I've done. So I better stop doing that, and I better do something to make up for that, to appease God's anger with me, so God won't be mad at me anymore. And now I'm on good footing again. That's legal repentance. But evangelical repentance is this. I have sinned against a holy and righteous God who has done everything for me to redeem me. My sin then breaks my heart because I love this God. So let me turn to Him and away from my sin because He's already saved me and He continues to pour out His grace and mercy on me. Can you see the difference? One is an act of God's grace. The other one is an act of man's work. And that, right there, brothers and sisters, is the fundamental difference between the Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation and the Protestant doctrine of salvation. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Whereas our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters teach that you are saved by grace through faith plus works like repentance and penance and confession and the sacraments. Manifestly, the gospel taught by Rome is not, excuse me, manifestly, the the gospel taught by Rome is a a works righteousness system. You must do some kind of works in order to make yourself righteous with God. Which, by the way, is in contrast to everything that we've seen that Paul teaches in the letter of the Romans to the very same city. Paul said, right, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He also even says the righteousness of God through faith is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He also says that we are justified by His grace is a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by what? Faith. He even began his exposition of this entire gospel by saying, the righteous, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel that Paul proclaims over and over again, in this letter written to the church in Rome, is a righteousness based on faith alone and not of works. In fact, he even says in the text today, the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This, by the way, is what the Reformation, in a nutshell, was about. wasn't about particular peculiarities of religion. This is what it was about. It was about denying the Roman Catholic tradition that justification was by faith plus the works that we do. And a return to the biblical gospel that we are justified by faith alone. This is why there was a Reformation. And this is why we, then, are not Roman Catholics today. The Roman Catholic Church, over time, allowed the tradition to change the nature of the gospel, and it went from holding a biblical view of justification to one that was based on faith plus works, which is now revealed in their view of repentance and Ash Wednesday and how they view Lent. It's a reminder to them they must continually work to stay in God's favor. It's what we call a works righteousness system. It is a righteousness that is earned by faith and the things that we do. And at its core, it assumes that Christ came in the world so that now I have the ability by faith in him to do my part to get into heaven. That's really the underlying assumption of all works righteousness and works-based systems. Now, I said that I, that that this picture was posted by a friend of mine who's a devout Roman Catholic. But, but you have to understand, I know lots of people who I care about and love who identify as Christians and as Protestants and even as evangelicals who actually subscribe in their own way to their own works-based righteousness system. Right? 
For example, there are a few groups of people who call themselves Christians whose beliefs are outside of the historic Christian doctrine. They believe that you must have faith, but they also believe that there are things that you have to do as well, that faith is not enough. One group says you have to keep the law and worship on Sabbath. One group says that you have to have this that they have to have an additional testament and then go to their temple and obey a bunch of rules so that you have the right to be sealed there. Another group says that you need to go door to door passing out tracts, right? And that you must not, you know, um, participate in, in holidays. And understand, I have friends in each one of these groups, people that I care about deeply, that I love, that, that I see that, we, you know, that, that they're, they're just really good friends and community members. But they all believe that, that you must have faith and some sort of works along with it. But understand, I also have friends who claim to be born-again Christians who affirm the historic doctrines of the church, who still will fall into some form of works righteousness. And an example of that primarily today is the social gospel. And I say social gospel because it's not new. It goes all the way back to the beginning or the early part of the 20th century. 20th century Christian liberalism And it saw that the point of Christianity was not so much to go out and make disciples of the nations. It was to go out and make the world a better place. That's the point of the social and gospel. And over time, that that has taken on different forms and shapes. It was at one point something called liberation theology. And it became feminist theology. And now it's been reincarnated as critical social justice or, or critical race theory and intersectionality. And this philosophy assumes that Christ came into the world for social justice. That's why he came. That Christ came to end oppression. That Christ came to end to dismantle capitalism. That Christ came to end inequity. And many of the people who believe that are actively pursuing social justice in order to prove themselves truly regenerate. In fact, there are even some who say, That if you're not pursuing social justice, you're not really even a Christian. Again, it's a system of faith based on outward works. Then you have moralistic therapeutic deism. It's three big words. We've talked about that before. But it's the dominant philosophy in Christianity today. By the way, if you want to know what the vast American, what what the vast belief system in America is, it's that right there, even though most people don't even know what that means. Moralistic means it's about being a better person. Therapeutic means it's about growing to be better internally. Deism, it's that the idea that God is there when I need him to be my butler to help me through my day. Okay, That's really the kind of dominant view of Christianity in the world. It's the idea that Christianity is about being more moral right, and being better adjusted. And it carries with it the idea that Christ came to make me a better person. That's the idea behind moralistic therapeutic deism, that Christ came so that I can be the better version of me. Because that's what Christianity is about, right? It's about self-improvement. That's the ideology of the American age. It's about getting better. It's about doing better, which again is a works-based system. And then there is the prosperity gospel. And I giggle because this one always makes me laugh, but it's so serious. It's a system that teaches that if you will just do certain things, like give money to ministers and the church and exercise a really, really big faith in God, then you can have all that your heart desires. It's the idea that Christ came to make you HWH, healthy, wealthy, and happy. And so it's not about faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's about doing things that demonstrate that you have an active faith in God so that God will give you all the things that you want in this life. And if you don't get healed, and if you don't get the things that you wanted, that's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. Again, it's an insidious system of works and not just faith. And I can go on and on, like the seeker-sensitive movement, the Torah-observant movement, the synergistic movement, the, the progressive Christian movement. All of these are varying forms of the same error, an error that's based on what you need to do for God. But what we're going to see here in the text is Paul, he absolutely destroys this notion that our justification comes by anything other than, than faith. So turn with me to Romans 4. 
I realized that was a long introduction, but this part actually goes really fast. You hope. <laughs> Paul says in verse 1, What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, I normally love the, Amer the English Standard Version of the Bible because it is very accurate as far as a translation. It's, it's, very, it's very close to word for word. Um, and the translation is typically easy to read. But this verse here is simply translated in a confusing way, and it's just unnecessarily confusing. Because I've read a lot of other translations, including the American Standard Bible, and the New American Standard Bible, and, uh, um, and many other translations, and it's super clear here. Right? So you see, the problem here is this word gained in this verse actually could just have been translated as discovered or learned, right? That, that would have made this so much simpler. They just would have used that word. So what can, so, so we can render this as saying is, is, is Abraham, what did he learn? Or what did Abraham discover, right? That's such an easier way to say that than what did Abraham gain? And then the expression, according to the flesh, is also confusing because unless you're really like slowly working through the grammar, it can be confusing because is he, you know, is what does this mean? According to the flesh, like, you know, what did he learn according to the flesh? Or or is he our forefather according to the flesh? Which is which is which? Well, in the context, Paul is saying, according to the flesh, Paul is our forefather, our physical descendant, I mean a physical um, ancestor to the Jews. And so in essence, Paul is what he's what he's saying here is he's talking to his Jewish audience. If you remember, he's in this ongoing dialogue, and he asks, What did Abraham, our physical forefather, learn about justification? Because that's what Paul's been talking about this whole time. He's been talking about justification. What did Abraham, right? The one that we look to as the founder of our, our religious movement, what did he learn about justification? Because you remember the passage just before this, Paul is having this imaginary conversation with a Jew who is struggling to understand the gospel. And he asks, what then becomes of our boasting? And Paul says it's excluded. Well, what, by what kind of law? Well, by the law of works. No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Paul is talking about justification by faith, and then he turns his attention to the Jew, to the, the father of the Jewish nation, Abraham, and asks, what did he know about this subject? What did he learn about justification? And then Paul says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. The thing that we remember is that the Jews asked, how come there's no reason for us to boast? We got lots of reasons to boast, right? They were selected by God out of all the nations. They, they were given the law. They had the sign of circumcision that set them apart. They had the dwelling place of God in their midst. They believed that they were something altogether special in the world. And as such, they felt that they had a lot of reasons to boast. And they felt superior to the rest of the world. And they thought their justification was about who they were and what they did. And Paul tells them, you don't have any reason to boast. You don't have any reason to think that you're better than the Gentiles. More than that, salvation isn't even by any of those things, but it's by faith. And then Paul, in essence, is saying, what do you think? And what he's saying in this, this text is, you think that you had a lot to boast about? If anybody had a lot to boast about, it was Abraham. I mean, if anybody was going to be justified by works that he was doing, Abraham would be the one that would do it. Because think about this, God chose not him as a nation, just him as a person. Out of all the people in the world, they picked him, right? And not only that, God then turned around and made him super wealthy. And then God promised him a son when he would, in his old age. And not only that, he then, by God's power, saved his nephew from conquering kings who took his nephew Lot and oppressed him. And along with that came even more wealth. And guess what? Abraham was so awesome, he took 10% of it and gave it to God. Right? And then Abraham interceded before God. I mean, this is, this is the kind of man that Abraham was, that he was able to even talk to God, intercede before God with the, for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, hoping there might be a couple of righteous people there. I mean, Ab God even said, I'll relent because of what you're saying. God himself visited Abraham. 
God personally made a covenant with Abraham. He even said that the nations would be blessed through him. And more than that, Abraham, he passed the test. I mean, how many would, would you have passed that test? God said, take your son and kill him. And Abraham took him up on, on the mountain and was going to do it. And God stopped him, right? Abraham passed the test. Could you pass that test? If anybody had the right to boast, right? It was, it was, it was Abraham. Abraham was the epitome of blessed. He was a huge man of faith. He did things that we would never dream of doing. And so if anybody had the right to brag about their work and, and their contribution to their justification, it would have been him. If anyone had a reason to boast in their works, it would have been Abraham. But even him had nothing to brag about before God. Nothing. Because Abraham, for all that he did, for all the awesome exploits that, that were recorded in the Bible, everybody knows the name of Abraham around the world, for all that he did was not justified by any of his works, but by his faith. As Paul writes, for what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. A couple of things that we need to note here. Number one, Paul once again grounds his understanding of the gospel in the Old Testament scriptures. The gospel of being justified by faith is not some new idea that's found in the New Testament. This is not a new novel idea that's new with Jesus and the apostles. It has always been there. It was always present in the Old Testament. The gospel of grace is not plan B. God did not have a plan of redemption through the law for one for the nation of Israel and then another plan for everyone else. God was not surprised that the Jews rejected Christ when they did and then suddenly decided, well, you know what? They rejected me. Let's graft these people in too. God's plan of redemption has always been the same. God has an elect people in every nation, tribe and tongue, and he's redeeming them throughout history and they are brought into the kingdom all of them in exactly the same way, by grace, through faith. And then number two, notice how crystal clear this is. Abraham believed God, and it, his believing, was counted to him as righteousness. This right here is, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world, right? But this is where we need to stop. We need to stop and really put away the rest of the world and, and meditate and think about what he's driving home here. We can take a moment and just put away the war on Ukraine. We need to take a moment and put away fears of the economy and these high gas prices. We need to put away whatever they're talking about now about COVID-19. We need to put away our struggles in marriage. We need to put away our fear of cancer and illness. We need to put away whatever our kids are doing in our lives. We need to put away all the distractions and all of the things in our life, right? And just take a moment and be here with the Lord and linger in this moment and think about what Paul is driving home to us, what he's saying to us. Paul is saying that righteousness, the same righteousness that is required to to be reconciled to God, the perfect standard that God demands out of humanity to be in His presence, the righteousness that Paul has been talking about throughout this entire book of Romans to this point, that same righteousness is counted to Abraham. It is credited to Abraham by his faith. We say it all the time, but do you understand the magnitude of what that's, what that's telling us? Right? The word translated here means is, is from the Greek, and it means, it's an accounting term, but it's also a logical term, and it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a reasoning and computation term. Right? It means to compute or to reckon, or at the bottom line, conclude something, or to decide something. In other words, the righteousness that Abraham needed to be right with God was decidedly credited to him by God, not because of anything that he could ever do, but simply because he believed God. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, more precisely, Abraham's believing 
God is, the, is then counted or reckoned or computed to Abraham as righteousness. Not the things that he's done. Not the deeds that he performed, not the works that he could take credit for. Righteousness is credited to him simply because he trusted, he believed God. This, by the way, is a direct quotation of the Old Testament. And the words mean the same things in both Greek and Hebrew. Right? So this is not a generational translation. Now with this clear text, how can anyone in the world and in all of history, take this text and all the other textual evidence in Romans and somehow conclude that there must be something else, that there must be something that I must do to contribute to this transaction of salvation. How could anybody conclude that? In fact, Paul even goes one step further. He doesn't leave it here for just for us to somehow trip over it. He says, now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is due. Now, if there's an analogy in the Bible that we're all going to understand, I think it's this one. Because if you go to work and you get paid, you understand really clearly along with everyone else in the whole world that your compensation is not the gracious gift of your employer to you. It was what you earned, what is rightfully yours it's due to you in fact if you if your employer does pay you i mean excuse me if you do work in your employment your employer doesn't pay you then there's about to be a problem right right and when you get your paycheck you don't stop by your boss's office and thank them for the gift of the money that they gave you right no you go and you check that check stub and make sure that they gave you exactly what you deserve they better not be shorting me this week I got what I got coming because I earned it. Right? It's what you deserve. And that's what Paul is saying here. If a person works, they get paid, and it's not a gift. Right? That's his wages. And by the same token, if a person does any kind of work for his salvation, then his salvation is then not the gracious gift of God, but a due payment for his efforts. No matter how you slice it, if salvation comes by obedience to the law, then your obedience to the law obligates God for your salvation. If salvation comes from pursuing social justice, then when you practice social justice, God must then justify you because you earned it. Paul says if one works, his wages are not a gift. They are what he rightfully earned, and the employer is obligated to pay them. This means if your salvation was contingent upon your ability to continually repent when you repented, God is obligated to save you. If your salvation was contingent upon you receiving the sacraments from the church, then the moment you received them, God was obligated to give them to you, to, to, to save you. But what we know is God, number one, is under no such obligation. First of all, God is obligated to no one. Second, no one has the ability within themselves to do all that's required to earn righteousness to be in a relationship with God anyway. Because if they could, then there would be no need for salvation. This whole talk about Christ on the cross and what He's done for us is just stupid, right? If you could earn your salvation, then you don't need Jesus. And worse, Jesus died for nothing. You see, works righteousness believes the lie that Jesus came into the world to give me a little bit of help so I can do my own part to earn heaven. Well, if that is all Jesus came to do, then his death is meaningless. Because again, if your works can save you even a little bit, even if you need assistance, you still earned it, at least portionally. But Paul destroys that notion and says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. There are two things really important to, that we need to see here in this text. Number one, the pattern of Abraham and his faith is then extended to the rest of the world. Abraham believed God, 
He had faith in God's promises, and that was the basis on which he was counted as righteous. We, like Abraham, are justified by the exact same mechanism. It's never changed. By believing in Christ, your faith is counted to you as righteousness. You understand that, right? All the righteousness you will ever need to stand before a holy and just God is yours, not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ has done and your faith in Him. We have the same righteousness as Abraham himself. Just let that sink in for just a little bit. God offers you eternal life in Christ. God offers you pardon from all of your sins, past, present, and future. God offers you adoption into his family. God offers you peace with him. God offers you the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you and give you the assurance that you have salvation. God offers you joy in heaven to come. All you need is to be perfectly righteous before God. (laughs) That's it. A status that you could never earn on your own. But then we are told, and the good news, that by believing in Christ, we are counted as having that same righteousness and are able to receive all, all that God has to offer us. You cannot earn it. Can you not see that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone? There's nothing that we can do to earn it. And I say this is because I still hear Christians saying things like, I need to get right with God. I need to try to be a better person. I need to do this. I need to do that. Hear me, please. There's nothing that you can do to earn God's favor. You don't need ashes on your forehead. You don't need to give things up for Lent. You don't need to beat yourself up to try to stop cussing. I mean, you should stop cussing because it's just crude, right? You don't need to go to a temple and learn some secret handshake. You don't need to stop eating bacon. You don't need to go door to door passing out pamphlets. You don't need to clean yourself up so that God will welcome you. You don't need to do any of these things. Because there's nothing that you can do to earn it. In fact, Paul leaves no doubt because look at how he describes God. This is the glaring truth in this whole text here. He calls God, look at this, the one who justifies the ungodly. If there's anything that you remember from this sermon today, if there's anything that you remember from this series to this point, let it be this truth right here. God is the one who justifies, who pardons, who declares to be righteous those who are ungodly. What that means for us is that the moment that you were justified, you weren't already in the process of being cleaned up. You were still ungodly. Notice it doesn't say that God justifies the formerly ungodly. God justifies the ones who are in the process of changing and not quite so ungodly. He doesn't say that. He justifies those who are in that very moment that he justifies them, that they are ungodly people. What this eliminates is there's any possibility of me doing anything at all deserving of justification because I am ungodly when God justifies me. I am undeserving. I am unworthy. Worse, I'm a sinner in the midst of my own sin when God justifies me. In fact, that's what Paul says later on in chapter 5. Just to give you a preview, he says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for who? For the ungodly. And then a little bit further on, he makes it even more emphatic. He says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, in the act of sinning, sinning our brains out, in that moment, Christ died for us. It has never been, nor will it ever be, about anything that you can ever do for God. And and, and here's the reason why this is so important. Is because we in this Christian life sometimes become convinced that somehow since I'm a Christian, then, man, I should have it together. 
I shouldn't feel the way that I feel about that person. Right? I, I shouldn't let my finger jump up when somebody cuts me off on, in the, on the freeway. Right? I shouldn't feel like throat punching someone. I shouldn't have the thoughts that I have. There's something in us that thinks now that I'm a Christian, I've been walking for God for, with, with God for 30 years, I should already be over what I'm, what I'm dealing with. I should be more perfect than I am right now. That somehow, someway, I need to work harder, try harder, and we fall into the same works-based righteousness as the rest of the world. But you weren't saved and justified by God by cleaning yourself up. And you're not going to keep yourself saved by somehow cleaning yourself up. You were saved by grace through faith in the beginning, and you're still saved by grace through faith even now. So that way when you fall down and make a mess of things, you're not running from God trying to figure out how to do penance so he'll accept you again, that you immediately turn to him and go, Lord, you promised. You promised to save me in spite of me. Here I am again, being exactly what you said I was. And I have nothing else in the world to hold on to except the promise that you made that Jesus died for my sins and lived for my righteousness. And I'm trusting in you to keep that promise. Brothers and sisters, you are as saved as anybody else in the history of people could be saved. It has never been about what you can do for God and it will never be about what you can do for God. Our God is the one who justifies the ungodly. Not because he sees good in them. Not because he looks down into the, into the vision of history and sees that we're going to choose him. Not because he sees anything within, within us that's redeeming at all. God justifies them simply by his own grace. But how can God then, who is good, rightly justify the ungodly and still be righteous? Well, as Paul has just said in Romans chapter 3, that through Christ, God is both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. In fact, let's look back at that really quick. The turning point in the gospel. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. And let us never tire of coming back to this place. For all have sinned and become ungodly and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption, the purchase that is in Christ Jesus, whom God himself put forward by his own will as a propitiation, a satisfactory atoning sacrifice by his blood to be received by what? Faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just, making sure that justice was done, and at the same time the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ, those sinners, those ungodly people. God is the one who justifies the ungodly because He Himself has put forward His own Son to live a life that we cannot live, to earn for us a righteousness we could never earn and to make atonement for our sins and to satisfy the wrath of God on our behalf so that we could then be counted, reckoned as righteous in God's own sight simply by believing the promises that He's made us to save us. Can it be any more clear than that? But there's something in us there's the legalist in us that wants to think that it's got to be more. Brothers and sisters, let us never be tempted to drift away from this truth. We are justified, we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is the gospel. This is why we are Protestants. This is why we're evangelical, going out into the world and sharing the hope of Christ with the rest of the world. Because we take God at His word and we know that this is the only hope that the world has. He justified the ungodly by faith because he is good and he is gracious and he's merciful and it's the supreme expression of his love for us. And if you have trusted in him, if you are in Christ, then rejoice 
with me in the simplicity and the beauty and the magnificence of the gospel and rejoice that you who were once an enemy are a child of God, not because of what you did, because of what Christ has done and by faith in that alone. And if you have not trusted in him, then I would call you to repent and believe the gospel and put your faith in Christ. Call out to the heavens for God to redeem you and he will save you. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.